I see they've separated you from your laptop. They? Off your game a touch yesterday. Perhaps they believe you've been humbled. Clever on their own, now there's two of them. Of course, it was always two of them. You just came to that late. <clears throat> Can we stop looking at you now? A little pale for Mossad. Although that could be very Mossad. I wish I'd be better funded. No, no, no. I work for another watchful shop, the name of which has not come up in your conversations with them. A stake in the story I'm writing. You have me bugged, or you want me to think you do? We were tracking 900 of them a month ago. We're tracking 1,600 now. The Great Conversion. It's real. It's happening. Well, then you have a more immediate problem than a book being researched. Got a name? You're not the first to attempt this, Mr. Malloy. I could give you the names of four others who have, and they're all dead. Or undead. The name's Raglan James. <laughs> Got a real name? Files have been placed with proper encryption on your comically vulnerable laptop. Most of primary sources that your infamous friends really in the here a fan house of intelligence of officers. We got a live one. Gochi Sasama, Teishasan. Hey listeners, welcome to the show. I'm Danny. And I'm Mark. And I'm Laura. This is a spoilerful podcast about Interview with the Vampire Season 2, Episode 3, No Pain. And the synopsis for this episode is Armand joins the history of the Theater de Vampire, or Vampire. Uh, Louis tells of his reluctance to join. All right, Mark, what are your thoughts this week of this episode? To keep it short and brief, because I seem to go a little bit too long after I edit and listen to the (laughs) podcast back. I thought it was a good episode. I really do enjoy it. And I did enjoy it very much. And I I think we get a little bit more perspective of Mon's thoughts of what happened during that time. And it's his perspective of his encounters with Louis, Claudia how the uh, Theater de Vampire becomes and uh, how Lestat became part of that and creating that and where they were before Lestat showed and after and what he created and then beyond. And then we get to what's happening with Claudia, Louis, Armand, Armand's infatuation with Louis. I, I just enjoyed it for the fact that it just like kept moving on the narrative of what we wanted to know within the story of these two. But it's from Armand's perspective, which I really enjoyed. And that's it. <laughs> Laura, what are your thoughts? Okay. So this is my favorite episode so far. For um, reasons I liked and disliked it that I'll get into, but because we got Sam Reed back as Lestat for a few scenes in which he was just utterly fabulous as always. And we got a very important book drop uh, in this episode. I really enjoyed it. It, I felt like it was picking up some more energy, um, mostly that Lestat energy, that I gave it 8.5 out of 10 wet boxes. (laughs) Wow, wet boxes. Mm-hmm. No yeah, rat boxes. Is... <laughs> <laughs> no rat boxes because you know Claudia has to shift from the body to the rats. <laughs> if anything, they're stinky boxes, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure they are, but apparently they were smarter in New Orleans than they are in France. <laughs> <laughs> right? They burnt all the bodies. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think, Danny? Uh, 
I this show is getting better by the episode and I'm noticing I'm paying attention to the changes that they've been making from the film book and the show mm-hmm. and I am liking the direction that they're going with this with the show and just um getting a better insight on Armand's way of thinking um I love was that like I don't know I guess the first season I was just not a fan of him but this season like he is doing such an amazing job playing the stat um and yeah. I'm liking Claudia when I have not liked Claudia in the past um <laughs> I just I'm like this episode definitely um I give it a I give it a 9 white boxes Nice really For sure Yes, it is up there. You don't want to know my rating then. Jeez. Uh-oh. What's your Go rating? Ahead. Give it to us. Uh, honestly, with this, is 7.9 wet boxes. If I had to give Ooh, a wet box okay. rating. Mm-hmm. Now, I was entertained. I was given a lot of information. I'm thrilled with the storytelling. But I still feel there's more to come that's going to going to basically make me love the show even more by the end of the season. So I don't want to give too much praise to a specific episode, but this had its moments and I do enjoy it. So you just like to, you'd like to reserve your kisses for the the big event. (laughs) Yes. That way at the very end, we could give our (laughs) ultimate idea and how many stakes we could give per episode. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. Put them in, in order. Yeah. Shall we continue with the uh, the episode and casual talk and favorite moments, scenes, character development, and what's going on? Yes. How about that we start at the beginning where they finally let uh, Daniel go on his own? I think he's like probably inside the building having lunch, having his del- delicious uh squiggling lunch (laughs) is omakase and he meets a stranger there at the counter oh yeah so i guess we already talked about this off air but i do you guys have what do you what are your feelings about this guy obviously the first thing i think of and all right listeners we had a little off podcast discussion really quick and i already talked about it it's something you actually do see within the episode. It's called the Talamasca. And I brought it up to Lara. Lara's like, well, they didn't really say it. And they, they do, but you do see it in a file in Daniel's laptop at a certain point when things key up. And you get this like weirding kind of guy talking to him while he's at this. Uh, what would it be called? Like a Japanese restaurant, a sushi mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, of course, he doesn't like the idea of having his, uh, you know, food wriggling and living. So the the chef winds up cutting its head off. Uh (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Trust me, I've been there. I did the same thing. So uh, I'm not (laughs) I'm in the same feeling that Daniel was. But I do enjoy, you know, raw fish at times. And uh, I love my uh, sushi as well. Anyhow. Yeah, I totally fangirled as soon as the guy started uh, talking about putting uh, files on his laptop and knowing Which we things. saw last episode, right? Or was it this so. one? It was this one. No, yeah, I think it was, this, it was this, this one earlier on, I think. Yeah, because everything started popping up. And he started mm-hmm. seeing files and he kept hitting escape. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah it was this one. Yeah. And so he said that he hacked his, uh, his woefully unprotected computer or something like that. And I was yeah. thinking, is Daniel's password for his computer password? Well, uh, given his <laughs> age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Boomer. <laughs> well, I love tech, Daniel, uh, but uh, oh, I right. could just see him using the word password as his password. <laughs> Well, all right. No slack to Eric Bogosian. 
who we love and we care for. Eric, Eric Pagosian's a, a great actor and very smart and intellectual. Uh, I've met him once on the subway. But I would say that, uh, yeah, uh, the character of Daniel Malloy is not very smart in general with his computer <laughs> and got hacked. And the fact that these people from the Telemasca were trying to give him information. And we know from <clears throat> this particular character who is by the name of Raglan James, and he doesn't want to be known talking directly to Daniel states that, uh, oh, we've seen this before. This has happened by four others and they're all dead or undead. We don't know. And the, the way he explains the Telemasca reminds me if, if any of you listeners are huge Highlander fans, like I am, I'm a huge Highlander fan. So now we all know that, you know, Henry Cavill might be the new Highlander, but there is a syndicate name known as the Watchers. The Telemasca is like that. But in this case, in Anne Rice's universe, it's more or less about uh, vampires, werewolves, witches, anything supernatural like. And they follow it. So uh, apparently he uh, this guy gives information to Daniel of what they've found and through his computer, but he has this conversation in this restaurant with them. And this is where we're at. And it's just like, what? And it's like, he goes, uh, apparently they were tracking 900 at one point and the month before. And then now they're at like 1600. Now when it, yeah, it's regarding Raglan vampires. brings up the uh, the great convergence, and we haven't heard that since season one. Correct. So that that's just to give a little insight of uh, what's going on within this world and yeah. and Rice's universe. Yeah, I I haven't yeah. read all of the Vampire Chronicles yet, but I have read all three of her Witching Hour series, mm -hmm. and so they feature very heavily in that series and eventually get into the vampire chronicles as well. So definitely be keeping an eye on them. I think I even might know some of the people that Raglan James alludes to as having tried to trifle into the lives of some of these paranormal creatures. So hmm. I will be interested to listen and see if they mention any of those characters who I think they might be. Yeah, and I, I love how Malloy just like shrugs it off. It's like, oh, what are you, Mossad or MI6? And he actually writes MI6 too in his notes. Yeah. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Let's see here. Um, I, I have to talk about the introduction of the Children of the Darkness that since we are now getting Armand's point of view of how he met uh, Prince Lestat. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm seeing that we have Armand being pretty much a, pu a puppet master when it comes to not only his coven, but, or covens, because he pretty much uses Lestat to destroy the children of the darkness. But now he's using, um, I feel like he's going to use Louis to do the same thing. And and he's going to, because like Armand uses Nikki, which is um, Lissette's lover, um, as to bring him to where he's at. Because mm -hmm. he knew that that's what was going to happen. Um, and I feel like that's what's going to happen with Claudia. He's going to he's going to essentially use Louis to destroy the theater of vampires. Mm -hmm. mm. So yeah, there are some things about. Oh, go ahead, Danny. No, I was just going to say, um, and we do see that news article of the destruction of theater of the vampires. We. Just we get a glimpse of this article that Daniel Malloy has been handed through this hack. 
and it has to do with the destruction of the theater. Yes, it was like a burning of the theater too. Yeah, during that time, so he traced it down to like an article, and he saw pictures of it burnt down, but he only saw the aftermath. He didn't see what proceeded before that. Mm-hmm. So this is where the story comes in, and I think this is the beginning of the story because. Honestly, it's the introduction of Claudia into the theater group. Yeah, and we didn't get a date on that news article either. So we don't know when it happens. Exactly. I, I froze the screen and tried to look for a date and I couldn't see a date on it. Yeah, I tried it too. And the funniest is, is that it, we, we, it, it gives us a, a, like a start point of the story of how Claudia is inducted into the theater. Mm-hmm. And how she wants this more than anything and doesn't understand why Louis is like staying away and being a drifter and who he is. And Armand is more attracted to him. But we do get the uh, the truth of the matter uh, within the episode about Louis and Lestat as well as Armand and Armand knowing and understanding who their true creator is, which is Lestat, not Bruce. But uh, it, it's like a kind of a dance throughout this whole episode between Armand, Louis, Claudia, Claudia and the theater group too, because we see an exchange with Santiago as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, with I was going to talk about that later. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. But the, and then on top of that, uh, Claudia wanting to be inducted into and wanting to be, and then her at the very end seeing that whole feeling of I'm stuck in this child's body mm-hmm. yeah. as this character, because he said for. Oh, for a century, you will play this character. And the look on her face was so upsetting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she looked pretty broken there. And yeah, I have some things to say about poor Claudia as well, who I've always loved her character always, but I just really, really felt bad for her this uh, episode. And I'll get into that. But as far as Armand and the... Um, children of darkness go I love that he's just living down there like um, (laughs) like rats in the sewer and um, he just some of the things that frustrated me about this episode and I'm guessing it might be because we're getting all of this from Armand's point of view exactly Armand might be sugarcoating his story just a little bit because um, at least in the books, he wasn't, he doesn't seem to be as powerful as Lestat, and he doesn't seem to have, at least in the two books I've read, a romantic relationship with Lestat. They do meet each other and they, um, you know, discuss um, the, the theater of the vampires, but mm-hmm. he is not, he's not really the one who starts that whole thing and it's kind of Lestat's idea but Mm -hmm. um it's really someone else who who goes and starts producing the vampire plays and everything but I think just a lot of the stuff that was either minimized or cut out of this story might be changed when we hear Lestat's point of view I'm not sure which direction the showrunners are going to go but um we're missing some major characters who should be around at this time. And for one, the one reason I was kind of upset is we miss <clears throat> Lestat's mother and she plays a huge role in the books. I hear at least from, from interviews though, that she's going to be in next season. So I'll, oh. I'll be happy with that because I feel as much as I love this cast and as much as I love this production, there is a serious lack of female roles apart from Claudia. Yes. And I was kind of really looking forward to Lestat's mother because she plays a big role in the early part of his life. But um, huh. we'll see. We'll see if she comes next uh, next uh, season, if we get a, a renewal, which I'm really hoping for. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping for that as well. Now that you mentioned that a mother with Lestat and how 
how Lestat is as a character, as a vampire, I kind of have to reminisce and think of another vampire who had a little bit of a relation with his own mother that created a monster in the vampire that he was. And that would be Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV series. Ah. So, uh, I don't, Lara, oh. I know you're not a fan or you followed that. I have never seen it. Okay. so <laughs> Not even one episode, but the, I probably char- should at some point. <laughs> the character of Spike was always tortured. And Penny, uh, who does uh, <laughs> who does Still Slaying, uh, a Buffyverse podcast on Podcastica. Cheap plug, everybody. But go check it out because it's pretty cool. Anyhow, Spike is a character that was always tortured by his mother, his peers, and everything else in real life, became a vampire, and then turned his mother into a vampire. And then she became very even more belittling as a vampire. And then he winds up destroying her. So I don't know the story of Lestat, his mother and everything within the books, but I feel it's the same apprehension or issues that, that Spike had with his own mother in real life. And when he was a vampire, as well as Lestat and his own mother that pointed him to abuse and manipulation. But I, I could be wrong. Think it was actually his brother. It was actually his mother. Oh, his mother was very manipulative. Mm-hmm. No, the the mm-hmm. the mother. I'm really not going to give away that. too much. Yeah, we, she we did. shouldn't <laughs> give away too much. But I, yeah. I'm just okay. saying. I'm just yeah. like I, from my from what you stated, Lara. I, that's what I'm getting. But for those of you who are Buffyverse fans, maybe this will. Like, segue you into reading Anne Rice (laughs) or if not following us even more (laughs) yeah Danny dropped off for a bit but I I just mentioned Danny that I I just feel like parts of Armand's story seems to have a lot of holes in it and seems to be a little sugar-coated on Armand's art so I'm basically saying Armand is a a lying liar who lies (laughs) yes yeah he's a pretty boy who lies (laughs) (laughs) um and again we are i in this season we are only really seeing Mm -hmm. armand's and louis point of view of who the stat is i feel like next season we are definitely going to be seeing more characters like gabrielle who is the stat's mother because Mm -hmm. i feel like at that point we're going to be getting or his point of view of how he came to be. So I feel like mm-hmm. we're getting webbed into, we're getting the str- the foundation of what's to come because, again, we don't know the Telemasca until the third book, you know? Mm-hmm. We don't get, you know, the ch- um, Children of the Darkness until the second book. So we're, so... They're building off of, you know, Armand and Louis to what happens next. And we're going to see a different side of Lestat when Mm -hmm. we do switch over to his point of view. But I will say that I am loving that they're not taking him out of the season because you would think that he would be kind of not in the season. Because yeah. they killed him off last season. And it's like, you would think like, this is just kind of like Louis and Claudia's story. But no, I, I really like that they're keeping him in the background of um, of, of Louis's head. And in the foreground when it comes to Armand's side of, of things. And yeah. when he's telling... I, yeah. Because this part of the book doesn't have any Lestat in it. And I, like I said, they Twilight New Mooned him in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Hey, at least he's not <laughs> glittery. Thank you for not being glittery. I don't know. He looked pretty glittery on that stage. Uh, I, I don't want to say that. No, that was good makeup. <laughs> that was good makeup. Uh, I, as uh, all you listeners will know, I'm not a huge fan of the Twilight series, but I 
do uh, grudgingly do watch it every once in a while as guilty pleasure. But yeah, no glitter, but makeup in a sense that, you know, they have to cover up for the fact that they're vampires. Well, that's why <laughs> the Scott suggested to uh, disguise themselves as theater actors because the white theater makeup covers their already unnaturally white skin and veininess. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Yeah, you, know, you you get to see the veins in their face and their neck and the leg, everything. Uh, very much almost like within the uh, the movie itself, interview with the vampire, which we covered. You do see that, and the fact is, is theater makeup does cover a lot. Unfortunately, it does enhance their heavy blue eyes, or <laughs> you know, and everything else that's there. Look at Louis. Oh my God, the beautiful blue eyes or light eyes that man has uh, on his, uh, you know, his tan skin. It's beautiful. Uh, same thing with Armand. You know, I have to say it, the, the, uh, Lara, we and, and Danny, we both have, we've all said it. They are beautiful people in this show. To be a vampire, you have to be beautiful. Have we? Unless we yet- you're the children of the darkness in his uh, sewer coven, because they looked pretty rank. Oh, those, they looked like they yeah. were smelly. <laughs> they, they, well, definitely. Well, what do you want? He was protecting them for 239 years, hiding them in the dark <laughs> during that time. Uh, apparently that was what Armand's, uh, plan was to keep them like somewhat homeless, smelly children sucking mm-hmm. on everything. But until they saw, uh, the sots like play and then even, you know, after he dismissed all his people that were the smelly kind, they wound up creating their own coven together which we are going to get into a discussion about too, because, you know, uh, Danny had brought it up that, you know, he, Armand had stolen Lestat's boy toy, uh, his living child, or uh, uh, what would you call it? His uh, sucking tube at that point, because literally he was just (laughs) using him as like a blood bag. To suck on Nikki. That's another thing that I'm hoping we'll get more of. I hope we get more Nikki next season. Yeah, he kind of got. He's only over. described as his his mortal lover. Yeah, and which was another rule that Lestat was breaking because you're not supposed to you know, reveal yourselves to the mortals. But I don't think Nikki knew at that time. But oh man, I, yeah, there's more to Nikki. I hope we get more of him. Same here. I, I'm curious about that character for the fact that. Armand kept them him alive during the time because mm-hmm. uh, let's stop when he shows up thinking that he's dead, but he's not. They they only drained him a little bit, and that's about it. Well, that was so that he could get Lestat to come to him. Literally, it was it was a trap to get him to come. And on top of that, we get the unique Lestat appearance, <laughs> him with a cross with Jesus on it. Oh, could I say that that's my next point is uh go ahead the stop the stop the stop the stop the stop the stop to, to quote, the, <laughs> quote the trailer <laughs> and, because and, our mom is obsessed with Lestat. Oh yes, and this <laughs> begins the love affair of Lestat and Armand. But the fact is, as soon as Lestat walks in, he goes, "Is it great? It's a great fun living in filth and stench such as this." And the lady goes, we serve Armand and Satan. Uh, Another man states on the side, you will bring down the wrath of God on us with your sins. And Lestat retorts, does he mean the sad man with the nails in his hands? Then Lestat breaks the cross (laughs) with Jesus on it and says, it's just a fallen tree. Whittled by the simple for the simple, the same tree made a table leg. Made your flute there. Crawl out of this prison. He's made for you. Meaning that religion was man-made. And they were fearing a false... And what he states as a vampire and living for so long is a falsified religion. 
And basically they felt at that point empowered being like gods amongst mortals and what they could do. Yeah. So it's at that point that Lestat empowers them. And then the next night at his play, they show up and they see how Armand had seen him at the first time at the, the theater, how Ian traps everybody with his magics using his vampire skills, his ingenuity. And at that point too, Lestat is able to talk to Armand saying there's more among you. And you see all the other vampires looking at Armand and wanting to follow and saying, we could do this all together. And then that's, and then and it segues right to uh, the theater, the vampire. And that's when they open up. And then that's when Lestat actually pays into, and I think that's when he created the business. And that's why we all know about this stuff with the lawyers and everything else from, from the previous episode, obviously. So it yeah. shows that uh, Lestat invested in this, in this case, but also invested in the idea that he was in love with Armand. And we see that love affair. I think that love affair was true, but I think there's something more involved that Armand is hiding to some degree to push Lestat away that we're not really seeing. We'll see it later on. And like you said, uh, uh, Lara, and even Danny, we're getting different perspectives of the story. So by the end of the season, it might segue all the way into Lestat's version. And who knows if Lestat shows up at the end and then segues into the third season. I, or- I still hold to the whole thing that Lestat's going to walk in while they're being interviewed. And he's like, do you want to know the actual story? You yeah. know, and then that's and then it just blacks out, you know, that would be yeah. kind of cool. And then that would be that would cool. be a great segue into the third season of just being Lestat, like, this is what actually happened. And this is how I, this is how I saw the world, you know? Yeah. But Mm -hmm. then it goes from interview with the vampire right into vampire Lestat at that point. (laughs) Cause he's going to be like, I'm so pompous. I have to talk about my theatrics right now. I'm a musician (laughs) here. I am in this world. (laughs) And I'm like, we just went from interview straight into vampire Lestat. How will they will they keep it as the show's title, or will it just be in dream sequence until that point? Until the show segues into interview with the vampire hashtag vampire Lestat. Not be sure good. how they're going to deal with that. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm curious, uh, uh, showrunners. If you're listening, please let us know. Because <laughs> I want to <laughs> know because you have to go in sequence of what's going on of these characters. And obviously we're getting interview with the vampire was always Louise uh, story as we all know. And then it goes into the other book, which is what uh, vampire Lestat, right? Am Mm -hmm. I correct? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and it goes in to another book regarding that, which continues the Anne Rice uh, series. But the thing is, is I want to see this sequence end. So I'm curious if they're going to go through Louis, Armand, or maybe even real Rashid. Who knows? Because real Rashid had a lot to give, by the way. And we haven't yeah, gotten real, into that Real yet. Rashid felt to me talking, trying to uh, explain away the vampire's need for blood and killing every night. Like uh, those women who write to serial killers saying... I love you. It's not your fault. It's the way you were raised. <laughs> it's oh. like, I'll just explain yes. away their nightly murder. It's just a yeah. biological need. <laughs> so basically, uh, Rashid, uh, real Rashid is basically a Manson fan. Marilyn, yep. uh, not Marilyn Manson. Sorry, not to use the wrong name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the murder. Charles Manson. Charles Manson. Uh, yeah, Charles Manson. People that followed that and uh, went to prison also, too, by the way. But it's kind of one of those people 
that just followed and just uh, obsesses over this. So uh, basically he drank the Kool-Aid and is there with them. <laughs> I will have to segue into this whole, they knew, they, they knew the truth about the stat. And I love the way that they, the, they played it off with Armand pretty much toying with Louis as they're walking they're like, Oh, so Bruce, right? And then he's uh, like, oh, yeah, he's like, like, he's there. He, he's in the background. And then Armand's like, you got to do better. You got to do better. But, you know, and then like <laughs> they're having that intimate moment at the yeah. little jazz bar. piano. Yeah, the jack bar. And he's like, Armand's like, he's back, isn't he? And then he's like, Bruce. And he goes, come on. And yeah. are, are we going to continue this? And then yeah, even if the stat, you can't stat, read minds, you know? I would tell I could tell that poor old Louie there can't lie for shit. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, Bruce, oh yeah, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very much just, almost like, like the torment that Claudia had too during that time, and how she described Bruce. Yeah, which, yeah, which, I, get it. We I have a point that. about that later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I I I love what they did with that and how it's coming to flourish and that they actually know the truth and they're just they're just playing it's like there's this is their new shiny toy and they're just playing with it until they get bored and like go and kill Louis and Claudia because I feel like everybody is in the know. And they think that Claudia thinks that she has them fooled. And so does Louis. But Louis is um, kind of um, holding back. Like, I don't want to be part of this, you know, this group, you know, because I'm not good at hiding things. And even as they're rehearsing everything, like, and trying to come up with a story, like, we both know that Louis is terrible when it comes to flying because he just doesn't know how to like. He how doesn't to play well with, with others. Life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We get that about his character. He likes to. All right. It, it sounds to me how I am in relationships with women. <laughs> As of late, I hold them at arm's distance. And I had to do that because uh, I, I actually mentioned this on a, another podcast that I was on. I got to get back together again with the ex, And she was a bit toxic. And apparently she, you know, changed. Well, obviously enough, within three months, to us together again. Yeah, she was toxic. Still, she has not changed. Mm. So I had to keep her at arm's distance to shield my heart some from being broken completely like it was before so more power to her keep moving forward but the thing is is that a lot of people are not knowing that but with louis he has been learning this over the course of how many years now how many years is he alive now at this point where his heart's been shattered not just from family but from lovers and from encounters with his own kind and people he deems as family, because even his own family has written him off at, at certain points. So he's hard at, I'd saying uh, trusting with his own heart uh, with people. And that's yeah. why he's like this with Armand. But at the very end of the episode, we see that how much he's giving in because of what Armand does for him at the end of this episode. Yeah. Which is very genuine. And I, yeah. I really appreciated that too. Now, mind think... you, uh, there was a lot of banging and bed banging and stuff like that. If, <laughs> I don't know if you're just I... getting at it. 
I wonder if um, our sweet, kind Louis, though, is hiding some hidden aggression because mm. when he leaves the jazz bar, he still sees Lestat. And, you know, everything that we see of Lestat from Louis is in his own mind. Mm -hmm. It's not Lestat. It's what Louis is creating of Lestat. And yeah, so his, his he, perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he starts making out with Lestat. And all of a sudden, Lestat says, kill me, kill me again. Tell me the only way you love me. And he just starts bashing Lestat's head into yeah. this concrete wall as Lestat, of course, is laughing hysterically. But we find out later that he's actually killed one of the gentlemen who frequent the park there that he's been going to. Yes. So he murdered someone, not for food, but out of like Passion. this repressed aggression uh, for Lestat. Yeah. Yes. And um, I have a feeling he might be like, have more of a tendency to violence than we think. Who knows, you know? But um, I just thought that was crazy that he like is still like infatuated with Lestat, but also wants to kill him. Oh, uh, yeah. Louis, Louis needs a therapist. Basically, is what you're saying. <laughs> and he's so many sessions, so many. <laughs> Maybe that's what he's doing with Daniel right now. These are his sessions. That is true. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're getting an insight of his anger here. So yes. just mm -hmm. imagine what's going to happen once whatever happens that destroys the fear of the vampires. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's going to be around. Claudia, but I will say this. I am a bit confused on this, and I want to say going to Claudia because um, in the film, and I believe in the book, Claudia is very much obsessed with women because she wants to be a woman, a grown woman, sexually, mm -hmm. have boobs, have everything, and here we have Claudia not obsessing over a woman, but over the theater. And um, having... at the very end, we do get that though, Danny. Uh, she shows the fact that, like, that that upset about how she's going to be trapped as a child, as part of yes. the theater group, at yes, for a hundred yeah. years. And she just the the shock and look on her face is the realization that I'm trapped in this body. I'm going to be cast as this character and who I am forever. I can never be with a man, boy, anything without them seeing me as a child. And I think that was the realization at the very end. But yeah, it, it's no, so sad. I mean what I mean is in the movie, she's not, she wants, she doesn't want anything to do with the theater. She, no. mm -hmm. she, she wants nothing to do with the theater. She, uh, she wants like, there isn't this fascination of these vampires and, and the killing that they're doing mm -hmm. as opposed to the, to the TV show where she's like, these are my people. I belong here. Like All I right. want to be part of this this coven mm -hmm. you know as opposed to the the movie where we see that she doesn't want nothing to do with the theater she wants she's more obsessed with having with a mother body figure and she wants his, mm -hmm. the mother figure you know yeah. and and asking louis like hey turn someone for me because i know that you are in love with armand and you're going to end up with armand and what am i going to have i'm not yeah. going to have anything you know and That's it's so like sad. Here, yeah, Claudia is kind of going into this whole, you know, coven of these vampires thinking that, yes, this is how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live out in the open. The mortals are, um, they don't match us. Like, we're supposed to be superior and they mean nothing to us. And we should be in front of the world and be open about everything. And so it's just very interesting to me the direction that they're going with the Claudia versus the Claudia in the book. And yeah. maybe that's what's yeah. going to end up happening next episode because, yeah, you're right. They they have dressed her up as 
a baby doll, you know, and she's yeah. going to be this child for the next 50 years, according to what I, what was said, I believe yeah. the role was created for, her for the next mm-hmm. 50 years. Yeah. And it's like, maybe that's what's going to drive her mad. Her insanity. Because, yeah. 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 So. I, I see what you mean, Danny. She, I mean, I, I do find the changes that they made this season interesting because Claudia did in the books and movie didn't really want have anything to, to have anything to do with the Teatro de Vampia, but um, yeah. she does have some body dysmorphia issues in this because she goes to the dressmaker and asks her to make a dress for her body because she's supposedly 14. I mean, she's not five like she was in the books or 12 like she was in the movie. So she, her body was starting to develop, but it like mm-hmm. abruptly stopped. So she's forever going to be in this 14 year old body. And, you know, I wasn't that, <laughs> I wasn't that womanly looking at 14. I was not one of those girls who, who advanced quickly. So she's always going to have like the sort of body of a prepubescent girl. Um, She's never going to look like a real woman, you know, even though the actress looks a little bit older than 14, but you know, that's what we're supposed, we're led to believe that she's always going to have this like preteen, maybe early teen body. But I do love um, that she's got more of this obsession with the theater than she did in the books because she's so she she loves that all these vampires have this vampire pride and that they're open and just right in everyone's faces about what they do and they don't even know it. And she's super obsessed with Santiago, which I find very interesting. Same here. Yeah. Santiago, to me, I feel like he 100% knows that they're lying. He is 100% mm-hmm. on to them. And oh, yeah. he <laughs> has some kind of plan in mind. Because when he asks Claudia, when they're having their discussion backstage, he asks her um, if Gary is just outside of Chicago. It, or he he said, so uh, he said, Louis from Chicago. And she said, yeah, um, Gary, Indiana, just outside of Chicago. He kind of gives her a halfway glance or something. And I just wonder if in his mortal, mortal life, he maybe went to the United States and maybe he knows something about the Chicago area and knows that she's lying. I just, he gives her a look that made me really feel like he suspects something of, of her and he's just playing along with her until he, Snaps his final trap. He also gave away his real name at a certain point. Oh, yeah. I forgot what it was. I forgot what it was, too. Uh, I didn't write that down. But for you listeners, if you have any key insights based upon Santiago, who is a favorite of mine and Lara at this point, (laughs) just let us know what your thoughts are if you actually delved into that. So we love your thoughts as well. Actually, uh, do that in feedback. And we'll tell you about feedback <laughs> later on. But uh, I did find it intriguing about how she got involved with Santiago and their relationship. And during that scene, it, it showed a lot of riveting drama in that. And honestly, throughout the episode, uh, I just love the fact that uh, Danny, you had already brought up with Armand and that whole uh, like, that dance that uh, that Armand and Louis had at the jazz club. And it was amazing. The music has been amazing throughout the show too. So I'm looking, f- I'm trying to look for more of the stuff musically within Spotify, everybody. I'm a huge thing of like, I have to listen to this Spotify stuff that's going on. And uh, I was at a client's house because I do home theater installation and I mentioned it to somebody and I was with a woman recently that does uh, music as well. And I mentioned it to her. She goes, oh, I got to listen to this. Oh, my God. I love different rhythms. I love all this stuff. So uh, the music has been very pronounced and very it's been done very well, not only classically uh, in the very beginning during the theater, but also within uh, the jazz scenes and everything else. And also the tension that boils up between Armand and Louis when they have that confrontation and they're leaving the jazz club, the, the violin stuff Mm -hmm. is amazing. So, uh, just to point a, a little thing that I really enjoyed, but, uh, I love the aspect of that 
uh, we get Claudia being more pronounced in this and giving us more focus on her, because I think this is where our next episode is going to lead to, because as we leave off on this episode, we see that she is in danger and mm-hmm. Louis knows this and Armand basically for one for warns uh, Louis about that at the very end before their major, uh, you know, rocking the world or apartment or bed, who knows? Uh, because yeah, uh, that that's what we see at the very end, but uh, coming attractions and everything else. We, we do know that it's more of Claudia's story. So in this case, this is more of the uh, awakening episode. I think, would you say that it would, this is more yeah. of an awakening based upon Armand's story point of view with Louis and their, uh, how they fall in love, but we still have to get the whole Louis half <laughs> of falling in love with Armand. And then mm-hmm. how I, I think this is going to go and lead into the end of the season of how the theater dies. I don't think we're going to leave off yeah. at, at a point where, oh, we're going to continue the story at this point. I think this is going to give us the story of the theater, how Louis, Claudia have met Armand, and then it's going to go to the very end and how it ended and where yeah. they're at after. or And it's going to, just going to continue. It's going to be a cliffhanger in my feeling. My feeling and my opinion, because how many more episodes do we have? We're episode what now at this point? Three, three. So Mm -hmm. this is the third episode and we have five more episodes. So, yeah, I I have a a funny feeling they're going to drag it out a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like, you know, I'm a bit confused because oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Danny, because I was going into another point. But if you have something quick, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just like, in my mind, I'm a bit confused because uh, as we know in the movie, Louis does not know that they're going to destroy Claudia. But here, uh, Armand is pretty much letting um, Louis know that she can't exist because Mm -hmm. the rule was broken and, you know, Louis like I I don't have any or um um my mind just went blank I'm sorry. Well, what did Santiago <laughs> speak Louis of was... the five laws? Well, the reason that Armand told Louis that Claudia can't survive or he doesn't think he, she's going to survive is cuz she's too she was made too young this is the excuse he gives to Louis she was oh, made right. too uh-huh. young and her mind is not going to be able to handle the stresses of eternity Correct. so after a certain number of years she's just going to go mad and probably throw herself on the fire like the other vampires but um that's the excuse that he's giving oh, okay. Louis right now is that he'd seen it before okay, that makes he'd sense. seen vampires that born too sense. young yeah all right well but i think it's a good way that they're drawing out claudia's story i think that's what they're doing because i think they want to keep the actress on a little bit longer so maybe they are drawing out her story a little bit more than they did in the books i mean she is a good character in the show not in the book or the movie but in in the show so i don't mind (laughs) <laughs> so I don't mind. <laughs> so I don't mind them dragging her out in the show. All um, right. Uh, um, he, all right. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, the five laws. This is something that Santiago reads as Armand leads uh, Louis away from the coven at that point when they induct Claudia into it, and this is key giveaways of what could proceed after this so basically each coven must have a leader who is the only one who can make the new vampires Mm -hmm. dark gifts of vampires should not be given to children the crippled or the maimed 
So we already have one strike against Claudia mm-hmm. and Louis. Uh, vampires should not reveal their true nature to mortals and allow them to live. Hold on, Daniel Malloy. Mm-hmm. That's on uh, Louis at that point. Vampires should not destroy other vampires, which they have done with Lestat, both Claudia and Louis. So that's also another strike at them on that day, too, when they meet the the troop. And then the lastly, vampires should not expose the history of vampires, which literally Louis is doing within this interview which Armand is accompanied with during this time. So during that time, back then, with Claudia and Louis, they have two strikes against them. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. during this time, Louis, over the course of centuries, has at least four, if you think about it. And including yeah. Armand and it, with one. Yeah. And even like as they're performing and our, um, Louis is in the theater and Santiago and Armand are talking, you know, mind to mind. And he's like, oh, look who decided to show up. And, <laughs> and you know, Armand's like, yeah, he's here to support the girls. And he's like, okay, well, we're, like we're destroying them. And Armand's like, no. And he's like, what do you mean, no? Like, you, um, you did my, to my maker, you, you imprisoned him for, for less than what they've committed. Like, mm-hmm. so obviously he knows about Lestat. And that's why he's like, hello, like, they've done way worse than what my maker did. And he's suffering the internal death. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're letting him live, and then, then Armand's like, okay, like after the ceremony, I will do what needs to be done, and he mm-hmm. goes, and I'm assuming he goes with the intent of killing him, and that's why he takes him away from, yeah, the coven. But yeah. I don't know, something might have maybe Armand's love for Louis and his pure heart. Well, what Armand says to Louis is. Why is it the weakest or the strongest ones are the weakest? Something to that effect. And I think he was talking yes. about himself. You know, he has all this power mm-hmm. and he is afraid. He just he can't kill Louis. He can't do it. So he's he's th- yeah. so powerful. But Louis makes him weak in the knees. Yeah. <laughs> he can't go through <laughs> with it. Uh, well, yeah, you know, the, the perfect couple, which is so weird. Uh <laughs> yeah, I don't it. believe it. I refuse to believe it. Really? I am I am Lou Stan all the way. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I wanted to get back to They're Claudia real toxic, quick. And that's just what it comes down to. <laughs> okay. Um just because this was one of the hangups that I had with last season. The one misstep I felt they had was her um was her um, sexual assault and they didn't oh, go yeah. much into it then. And I, I felt like it was really unnecessary that they didn't need to have that. I understand that it's a thing that happens to women and it's very common and it's extremely unfair and unsaid. And it just, it's kind of like when we were watching game of Thrones and, you know, it seemed like every other week there was some sort of sexual assault on a woman and the, oh, yeah audiences were just like cut Mm -hmm. it out we don't want to see this anymore so i was of that nature i didn't want to have to see this especially of claudia who i loved in the book and i loved in the movie and i thought she is such a strong powerful vampire how can this happen to her which you know it can happen to anyone even if you're super powerful but i just didn't like it and then in this episode we hear about the way that bruce treated her Mm -hmm. and we find out that it just wasn't Mm -hmm. the one incident in the forest that he was keeping her under the floorboards he was you know raping her day and night and just saying horrible things saying he loved her 
Oh yeah. God. It's just like so yeah. horrible. I, and and I was upset heart about that. Breaks for Claudia. I'm like, I, my heart breaks for Claudia from the moment she was born. I mean, Louis loves her, but for one, she wasn't supposed to be created for another Lestat just didn't want her and never gave, I mean he had fun with her for a while as his pretend daughter but then you know got tired of her when she got in the way of him and and Louis and then she runs off gets attacked by this person comes back home tries to tell Louis to leave with her all hell breaks loose. Louis yeah. gets attacked. And, you know, when they finally get to Europe and she's finally with a group of vampires who they who she admires and she loves and she thinks loves her, we get the thing that happens at the end where they basically are like, they've called her pousse this whole time, which is the French word for flea because that's what they call the flea markets yeah. in Paris. Pousse. And I give her a flea circus as a <laughs> joke. Yeah, they're hazing her the whole time, but she finally thinks she's made it. She's she's been indoctrinated into the group, or you know, inducted. I'm sorry, she she's been inducted into the group, and yeah. she's finally earned her her wings. She's going to be on stage, and they give her a baby doll dress, like the one thing mm-hmm. that she, she did absolutely has anxiety and trauma over is yep. that she's a little girl that's never going to grow up and. And then the, to hear the whole story with her and Bruce was just very heartbreaking. And then also yeah. she's trying to open up and tell this to Louis and Louis, like, I mean, I imagine if this was recounted to any kind of father, he's like, I don't even know what to say to you. He can't even talk to her. So I, it, that might be one of those things where she's missing, you know, a mother or a mother figure or another just female that she could talk to and i felt so bad for her it it was so sad to watch that that whole scene because even when they throw the flea circus in her face with that whole elaborate little mechanism Mm -hmm. i i knew right away and and the look of depression and sadness on her face at that point saying i'm just a gimmick Mm. I'm I'm here for your plaything and that's it. It's just as bad as it was with Bruce. It was just as bad as it was with you know, of all things Lestat. And then she doesn't really think of Louis because Louis genuinely still cares for her. Mm-hmm. But she can't see it that way. She yeah. wants to thrive be more of an adult, be more of a vampire. But she can't within this body. And I think this is where the tone of the story shifts with her character and where she kind of drastically goes towards that uh, dressmaker that we know of from, because within the movie, it was something else. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I and and the, I'm sure in the book they had something else regarding it, but and the fact that it, it's heartbreaking, and it breaks my heart when I see that character too, like that because you care for them, you want so much to re- have a resolve, but they don't, and it's just so sad. I, yeah, I, Claudia is a tragic figure in this whole. She's probably one of the most tragic figures. Oh. I think but, a lot of them have tragic backgrounds, but I think she is a very tragic figure in she this. She is tragic, uh, but she's in strong series. in the show. Yes. That's the sad mm-hmm. part is she's so strong. What <sighs> Bailey Bass did and uh, was it Haley Bass or Bailey Bass? Bailey did. Bass last season. Yeah. And Delaney Hayes mm-hmm. this and season. And Delaney yeah. Hayes this season. They gave her so much strength. And just to do away with that character. But that's how Anne Rice wrote that character. And it's, we don't know if that's their plan either. They've changed we, a lot from the books. Yeah, that is true. So my hoping is that we get her for at least another season. But, you mm. know, that's just me hoping. Because I like the character so much. 
mm-hmm. you know, her strength more than anything too, because in her hopeful, hopefulness as being a vampire, uh, she has so much, especially what she does with <laughs> Louis throughout this whole episode and saying, uh, where were we in Chicago and what were we doing? And what did Bruce do? And she was coming up with everything, the strength in the stories, everything. She was down to the T. Mm-hmm. She and then Louis I wonder, get on board. <laughs> I was going to say, I wonder if her comment about because as she's having that conversation with Santiago. Like she's talking about, like, oh, I like the, your powers that you that you got from the blood you drank, and then she says, or they, Santiago asked, oh, what's the power that you got, you know? And she's like, um, the ability to lie. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I wonder if that was not really Bruce, but more Lestat, because she even oh, goes yeah. in there, like yes. she says, like Lestat could have literally told us get on a boat. You know, there's this theater of vampires that I created, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he didn't do that. Like, what kind of person <laughs> is he? He could have, like, let us come and be part of this, you know? And all he did was talk about how vampires are evil. And I walked, you know, and then he made me a believer because I ended up running into Bruce, who was evil, you know? Yeah. Oh, so my God. That just and if fed that, into his lie. If that guy, Bruce, does not get his just desserts somehow, I don't know how they're going to do it because he's in America and they're in France. And if we know the source, source material, we know what happens in France. But, oh, my God. Like, that character wasn't in the book. But in this series, if he needs to get some serious, serious retribution. We need mm. We need justice for Claudia. That's what I think. And I hope she gets to give it herself somehow, some way. Um, And I definitely think she was referring to Lestat when she says that her maker taught her to lie. Because Lestat (laughs) is the father of lies. Is the Yeah, yes, exactly. Claudia calls him in the movie. Well, he's the greatest actor, (laughs) as we could tell in this episode, Mm -hmm. in the very beginning, to all the human folk. So, Uh uh-huh. Yeah, I do wish we could have got acrobatic uh, Lestat like we have in the books, Danny. Because <laughs> isn't it when he when he um, he teaches them that they can be great actors because they're vampires, so they're so acrobatic and they can do these feats that humans can't do. They can twist their bodies in ways, and they just have this crazy way of like acting that humans can't do. Huh. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. But we didn't get that. We got a little bit of him the prancing around on stage in a very elegant way, but not yeah. the acrobatic Lestat that I was hoping for. But oh uh, Sam Sam Reed brought it. He was so great. I was I definitely was missing the Lestat energy, so I got a, a dose of it here. Yeah. Oh, and I do like that uh he negs uh, Armand to get him to follow him and to get intrigued by him. Yes. <laughs> like he ignores him, he ghosts him. He calls him like <laughs> rats or whatever he called him. The you know, oh you dirty little people. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and the more he does that, the more her mom starts to fall for him. Yeah, I know, mm-hmm. right? Love the stat. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us can help it. Yeah. Is there any more notes that you guys have? Uh, I have one note, but it's also a question. <laughs> Go for it. All right. If it wasn't Uh-oh. Sam Reed in this particular uh, guise of Lestat, who would you see or picture as being Lestat? Hmm. In the show. question. Kind of weird, but I already I have an answer uh, to mine, and Lara will definitely well, appreciate. I remember one. when this whole, yeah, I remember when this whole um series was brought up. Mm-hmm. I know that uh, Anne Rice was looking at um, I think his name is Stephen something from he played Arrow. 
Um, oh, Stephen Amell. Um, yeah, that's who. That's who Anne Rice wanted to play Lestat when. Interesting. When she was writing the character for Lestat. Uh yeah, uh, our friend. That was like several years ago. Yeah, our friend Ben Beck uh, has met and interviewed and moderated panels with Stephen Amell, and I remember Stephen Amell from Arrow, and Stephen is, yeah, handsome looking dude honestly uh he's gone on and done uh, a wrestling show if uh not many people know about it but uh, i really enjoyed it it was out on stars <clears throat> i i mm. he he's a really handsome dude so uh he played arrow in the uh yeah. uh the cw universe on uh yeah, or like the flesh <laughs> or the flesh of verse, uh, as I like to call it. But uh, yeah, I, I could see him, Stephen Amell, definitely. But how about uh, you, Laura? What, who do you think? Oh my gosh, I can't, I, I don't know. I it takes me a little while to think about. I do actually love to fan cast uh books and things like that, but it Go takes ahead. me a little while to think about who I want because I want someone who has that essence and. For Lestat, he has to have this very aristocratic, arrogant um, persona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know. I was, I, if we were going way back to like the 80s, I was thinking maybe like a, a someone between Julian Sands, someone who looks like Julian Sands, Ooh. and someone who acts like Gabriel Byrne. How's that? Awesome. <laughs> I, I can see Julian Sands. Yes. Yes. Uh, R.I.P. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he's honestly he's still a great actor, and I love. Uh, if a lot of you uh, didn't see the movie that has Sherilyn Fenn in it, uh, Boxing, <laughs> Boxing Helena. Helena. That movie was nuts. Bananas. It was nuts, but I thought it was great. And he was also. Um, it was kind of a witchery kind of movie that he was in too. I forget the name of the well, movie. Well, he was in Gothic with Julie with Gabri Gabriel Byrne. That's why I thought of the two of them. Oh, uh, okay. Because he has the look mm. and Gabriel Byrne has the attitude. Yeah, he was in a lot of full moon movies back in the eighties and nineties. Oh, maybe you're thinking of Warlock. He was in Warlock. That's exactly it. That's it. Yeah. So mm. that that's how you get that kind of mysticism with him. And that's why I could think of him that yeah. way. I can't think of anyone right now, though, but maybe I'll come back next week with a, a, a choice. Well, mine will shock you, Lair. Uh, You have covered The Witcher with our friend Stephen on my Panels to Pixels podcast. Mm -hmm. Henry Cavill. And I had a side-by-side -side image of both Sam Reed and Henry Cavill with the, you know, I, I saw Henry Cavill with the blonde, the white hair, but it could be blonde. And the light eyes as Geralt of <laughs> Rivia. <laughs> and I thought right away, because he's done period pieces and has that attitude. He has the same chiseled chin features and nose. Yeah. And okay. can present himself now. in pompous way. He could actually play Lestat if he really wanted to. Not only could he play the Witcher, he could play Superman, but he could also play Lestat if he really wanted to. <laughs> so I saw him recently in the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Yeah. And he was a little bit like he did have some charisma there. Yeah. Geralt is very stoic. I don't know if he's kind of got he doesn't really have Lestat's charisma. But he had but the look maybe. as that. Yes, yeah. he's got the look. I think he would need to have a little bit more flamboyance and charisma to be the stat. I think so too. But I think he has it with him, within him at, at certain points, if you really wanted to. He has that smile that is reminiscent of Sam Reed, if uh -huh. you think about it too. And I, I, it's not me and my love or admiration of uh, Mr. Henry Cavill, but it's the fact is like, I just thought about that. And I saw the images side by side one day and I'm like, holy crap, this could work. <laughs> I thought it would be great, but you know, it would be every uh, male uh, fan of Henry Cavill, whether it be uh, sexual or not.
<laughs> they, they would be like, yes, yes. <laughs> I think a, Sam Reed is perfect. Or even a woman. I'm so glad they got him. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think Sam Reed is really perfect at the character too, myself. But I, I, it just came upon my head one day when we were talking and I said it to uh, Stephen, who I work with today. And he goes, I was try- and I was telling you earlier, I was trying to convince somebody who I work with trying to watch this show and his wife is a love of horror films loves uh you know uh all that kind of stuff and i think she has read a few Anne rice books and he goes i gotta put this down on my list of stuff to watch now <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing is is that he said to me he goes i could see that because he watched the witcher and he goes yeah i could see that that'll work and I said, yeah, it'll work on every perspective and every ballpark, sexuality, looks. And I think he could probably hit it out, uh, out of the park with the uh, with the acting and everything, too. But that's just me. You can tell me I'm wrong. Everybody listeners. I don't care. Uh, I, I really <laughs> think uh, I'm I honestly did. I think Henry Cavill was the greatest Superman. No. But was he good? Yes. Do I think he's a good actor? Yeah, I do. But uh, our listeners can just send us their ideas of who they see as listeners. Exactly. And I'm sure yeah. Sam will probably send us something too. Because, you know, <laughs> oh, please. Be if we got something from yeah. Sam Reed, I'd fall on the floor and die. I met our friend Sam, but if Sam Reed wants to come too, but oh, I do yeah, hashtag yeah, him all the Sam, time when I put these episodes Sam, out. <laughs> Sam or Sam or anyone. Sam <laughs> send us send us something <laughs> and let us know what you think or I on one uh, for an on one in new zealand too mm-hmm. uh we didn't get a uh any feedback from on when i was hoping to but uh before we recorded tonight but on when you could still send us feedback no matter what <laughs> so next week send us <laughs> feedback all right yeah i i had a couple of notes did you have any notes danny no, I think we pretty much covered most of my notes. Here. So I yeah. had a couple um, vampires with hay fever or who need a cool breeze in their apartment. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I I yeah. get that they maybe that sneeze part where the where she sneezed off stage was supposed to be for last, but I'm like, yeah. they're vampires. They don't get hay fever. They don't get cold. No Except allergies. I, I do like the idea of um, their blood feeling cold when they when they're drinking bad bad blood. I can accept that. I cannot yeah. accept that they need to open a window and a door so they can get a breeze through their French apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I like. Sir. I feel the same way. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I had to just because I've taken seven years of French, even though I'm not that fluent in it. I thought the actor's French was very good because we get a good portion of this episode in French. And I, I was listening for it. And some of the, the side actors, like the, the children of the darkness downstairs, their, their French sounded a little choppy, but I thought Sam Reed does a really good, um, he, he did, he did his lines in French very well. I thought mm-hmm. they sounded good. Probably not to native French speakers, but I could understand what he was saying and it sounded great to me. So I was like, yeah, way to go. Both uh, Ahmad, uh, Ahmad, Assad, Assad, Zaman and um, and Sam Reed had to do a lot of this in French and they did really good, in my opinion. I think they yeah. had great guides in what they had to do. And yeah, I, I definitely agree kudos to them uh it sounded perfect and in my opinion i don't speak french or understand french but it sounded like really fluent to me those are my notes me too yeah um how about any quote uh i I had one one. (laughs) I had one, and that was uh, from the theater guy backstage when he was at the wet box with uh, Claudia, and mm-hmm. he's teaching her how to put the body in one side, put the rats <laughs> on the other. And as they're <laughs> about to leave, he goes, they found the heart. <laughs> the rats found the heart. <laughs> yes, yes. That was a... I love that. I love that scene for the fact that it's like, he goes... Get the days right. It's every other day. 
this and that. You don't want to be subject to blah, blah, blah from our, uh, what did they call her, Armand? I forgot, but he's in charge of everybody. Maitre. The Vetra, yeah. Ma- and maitre is the French word maitre. for master. Yes, mm-hmm. like a maitre d'. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and he was like, it, it's him trying to teach a lesson. But the thing is, is like I, I said it to Steve today when we were talking in the vehicle as we were driving to the job and to and from. He was like, I said to him, yeah, God forbid if Claudia put the living person in with the rats. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, I got to watch this show. This is so interesting. <laughs> so it's me trying to convince people to watch the show, everybody. I, I, I'm trying to convince my friends who I, I work with or who I know that are interested in stuff like this to watch something like this. But uh, he goes, yeah, I like that. So he's going to tell his wife. But yeah, I thought that was a key quote. (laughs) And I I love it. Danny, did you have one? Yeah, I I definitely love when uh, Louis is confessing to Armand that he killed um, what's that? And then he's all like, I killed him. He deserved it. And then let's that in the back and go, mm, debatable. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part too. <laughs> yeah, the back of his head is like, yeah, debatable. I only have uh, two uh, more. Like One it. would be from the real Rashid saying, and this is uh, in regard to Daniel Malloy's pl- like, just like, just attacking him verbally about everything. And Rashid goes, but he can kill us now, but he doesn't. They're peaceful, uh, peaceful beings. And Malloy just goes, they drain and dis- disappear us. Rashid goes, they have a biological imperative that is in conflict with human morality. But what is that morality other than rules agreed upon? Which is very yeah. interesting because it's like a conditioning of a familiar of yeah, uh, like he's these people. Yeah. yeah I was like gonna say if Rashid believes that, I've got a bridge in San Francisco to sell him. Exactly. Or to jump <laughs> off. He thinks they're peaceful creatures. But they're never yeah. gonna turn him. I think it's like the uh hey Rash- real Rashid. We'll give you eternal life, but you have to do all this. Oh, okay. So they keep him alive to utilize him as a slave till they are finished with what they need from them. And then Daniel's like, yeah, until they dismiss you and then they drain you. And that's it. It's really Mm -hmm. sad because it's almost like a cult. It's like Rashid drank the Kool Aid. I told you he's the he's the ladies who write love letters to serial killers. That is true. <laughs> I only have one more, but if anybody else has any other anything else stated, no. Nope. Uh, mm-hmm. Less one I would. Um, the one thing that I have is the one where Claudia and Santiago are having that um, discussion, and this is why I think Santiago knows that she's lying because when she when he asked. Like, oh, you know, you said Louis is from Chicago and she goes on, you know, oh, no, she, he's from um, Gary or whatever. Indiana. All of a sudden, he turns to her, gives him this, like, look and says, stay with it, puss. You're almost there. Like, mm-hmm. you're, you're like, your your lies are, like, almost clever, but they're not. They're not, mm-hmm. you know. She's yeah. not sticking she to her own script. Thinks, yeah. Yeah, and I think she's thinking, like, you're almost there as, like, oh, you're almost an actor, you know? But, mm-hmm. like, Santiago's thinking, you're, like, you're almost there, ready to deceive us, but you're yeah. not there, you know? Yeah, that yeah. could, all, so that that could have a total one. double meaning to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I thought, it, to me, it sounded like Santiago saying, I could smell the fart, just like a fart in a car. <laughs> I hate saying it, but it's just to be plain and dirty and disgusting. But that's literally how Santiago stated it to her without her realizing it. It's like, yeah, I know your game. I know your play. Yeah. 
Exactly. You, you're not fooling me. And this is where. Uh, and this is towards the end of the episode. So obviously the trick is there from Claudia to them. And she's not able to keep up that that story. Meanwhile, Armand is leading Louis outside through the tunnels, back to his house, to his apartment, and then Louis going, if I invite you in, will you kill me? <laughs> and then they go in and they make love and whatever. Yeah. And then and we see Claudia relishing the fact that she's in, involved with the group. But yeah. by, that's where it leads us into the next episode, which we haven't seen yet, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. But I have a funny feeling it's going to come to a tragic end. Or maybe not. Not Let's yet. See. There's still, I, we still have five episodes. So something, so here's what they're going to do with the next episode. The story will, can continue. And we yeah. can find out as we go. So, yeah. But uh, I have one last quote, and that's it. And it's from Daniel okay. saying to uh, Raglan James, a stake in the story I'm writing, or you have me bugged, or you want me to <laughs> think you do. And that's uh, Daniel being paranoid and skeptical because, you know, he's writing down MI6 and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these other yeah. different companies. Yeah, I'm very interested in that because I don't know um, when it's coming out, but I believe AMC has greenlit a another series in Anne Rice's Immortal Universe based on the Talamasca. Really? Yeah, so that will be interesting because I'm sure that events that happen in this series and the Mayfair witches will probably feed into that because Anne Rice never did write a book solely about the Talamasca. So any stories that come out of that may feed out of these two series, but also anything about that series will be original material. Interesting. All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any more quotes. All right. Well, uh, with that, well, I guess we can move into feedback, right? Yeah. yeah, let's hear it. All right. Well, we didn't get any Facebook feedback or any emails, but we did get a voicemail message from our friend Sam Lowe. So I'm going to play that right now. Yay. Hi, Danny, Lara, and Mark. It's Sam. I really liked this episode as well. I think that's just going to be my theme for the series. It was a big tonal shift from last week, at least for me. Last week was very intense. There was a lot of tension between the characters and in between the scenes. This week was more of an information dump and kind of tying things together, which is not me dumping on the episode. I actually really liked it. I mean, they did a great job of introducing the title mascot. When he said Raglan James, I leaned in. Tell me more. I want to know more how this is going to fit in. <laughs> it's with Interview with the Vampire novels canon because they introduce themselves to Daniel, not to Louis, at least as far as we know. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how almost like these dual storylines play out. And I'm wondering, are they going to introduce us to werewolves and demons? I know they already tried to introduce us to witches, but I'm with you, Laura and Mark. I did not like the Mayfair Witches, and I only made it a few episodes in, <laughs> which is a shame because it's a great cast. I just didn't care for the writing and the directing and how it all came together. Um, yeah, it, it was just such a really great thing, so I'll be fascinated to see how it plays out. And I had forgotten <laughs> how much Anne Rice likes to play around with the truth because her mm -hmm. novels are all from the point of view of the main character telling it. And it is really, like there's one person's truth, there's the other person's truth, and then the actual truth is somewhere in the middle. And I had forgotten that until Armand's flashbacks of Lestat. I totally agree with you guys. You guys called it. Armand is like a jealous partner. Like, he's like, oh, this ex. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, <laughs> like he's describing <laughs> Lestat the way at least some of us will describe someone that we don't like, you know, will exaggerate their tone or their <laughs> words or their mannerisms when we're describing someone that we don't like. 
<laughs> and it really did come across that way. I mean, it was a phenomenal scene. It just really stood out to me of like, ah, uh, yes, this is this is exactly what this is. So we haven't seen like the true Lestat. We've seen Armand's version and Louis's version through Armand's filtering. Because season one was all Louis's memories filtered through Armand. So I am curious to see how this plays out when we eventually do get the vampire Lestat. I know this episode was like one third interview with the vampire, one third the body thief, tale of the body thief, and one third the vampire Lestat, as told from Armand's point of view. So I'll be interested to see how this plays out. And we didn't get any Gabrielle. So I'm wondering if they're just not including her character or we'll figure out who she is later on. Um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. And oh, poor Claudia. I feel like we're watching a slow motion car wreck with her. She is going to lose her mind mm -hmm. and we're going to watch it. And I get a feeling it's going to be beautiful and painful at the same time. Also, I was rewatching season one. And Louis had a burned arm. Like it looked like he'd stuck his arm out into the sunshine. So I'm wondering if after Claudia's death, he becomes suicidal and Armand starts brainwashing him for all these times, um, obviously for his own self-interest and also to prevent Louis from hurting himself because he made that promise to Claudia. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. They, you guys nailed it. It's a very performative interaction between the two of them. Any of us who have been in long-term relationships know you're not that lovey-dovey after a few years. After 77 <laughs> years or whatever, you're going to be arguing over who yeah. dripped yeah, some blood accidentally on the carpet. Like, I, you guys are not going to be that lovey-dovey. So I'll be interested exactly. in how this plays out. Why do you guys think <laughs> that Armand brainwashed Louis? And how do you think Lestat's going to come to the rescue? <laughs> oh wow. Oh, I love you, Sam. Sam is the podcast number one super fan so far. We love you. Yeah. 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 We do. And thank I love you. her thank theory. You, I love her theory about Louis possibly being suicidal and yeah. Armand reassembling his memories to keep him from stepping into that fire. That's that's a really good theory, Sam. Yeah. That is. Especially since the pages were missing and of Claudia's diary. So I wonder if he's forgotten some of the things and Daniel Malloy has been pulling or asking the right questions that's making Louis like, wait, what actually happened? You know, and starts questioning his his memories of things. And or, maybe Lestat does come in and, and rescue, you know? Uh, well, well, maybe Armand had ripped those pages out himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of those uh those passages in that diary so well, he that does way... tell louis that there's passages with him in it when louis asks him to have the pages back yeah mm. so yeah he's hiding something excellent yeah. excellent feedback yeah Do you want and... me to read the outro mark sure uh, uh so if you would like to leave us uh, some feedback just like sam did or just say hi if you can just send us an email or a voicemail message at talk at podcastica.com. If you head to podcastica.com, there's a handy voice message link. Uh, and you can check this out on social media, Facebook, like uh, facebook.com forward slash podcastica, Twitter at podcastica, and Instagram at house podcastica. Or you could send an email address because this is a collaborative uh, podcast between Adrenaline Cinema Podcast and Podcastica. You could just send your email directly to at Adrenaline Cinema Podcast at gmail.com. Or you could just record your voice just like Sam did and send it directly to Adrenaline Cinema Podcast at gmail.com and send it as attachment. And it worked out perfectly. So uh, Sam did that for us, and uh, I appreciate that, Sam. Continue to do so. Uh, I We do appreciate your feedback. We're looking forward to our friend Anwen, who's out in New Zealand. She's been listening, and she wants to send us some feedback. Apparently, she couldn't get anything to us before we start recording tonight on the 29th of May. So I'm hoping that uh, Anwen will actually do that before we record next week. And then, uh, yeah, on when you could say whatever you want, it would be eloquent and would love to hear your thoughts about the show, what you think of the podcast, 
and uh, our thoughts are the podcast too. Anyhow, while you're at the podcastica.com website, if you haven't already, just check it out. Uh, there are other podcasts on the Podcastica network that you like, like what I do, which is the Sandman cast, which I, I do with uh, our friend Jamie Dimmick, and we're covering Dead Boy Detectives season one, and we're continuing our coverage. Uh, we just recently did season one episode five we're going to continue on next week with episode six so if you guys want to uh, send any feedback do so go to podcastica.com follow the links send in that feedback for this particular episode uh, i know our friends at tv podcast industries that's friends with podcastica and myself on adrenaline cinema podcast and pals to pixels podcast uh you got derek and john and their friends that have covered that they finished up and wrapped up. We're doing episodically. So we're doing episode by episode where they were doing it two episodes at a time. You could hear me on panels, the pixels podcast where Steve Brown and I are covering the new uh, Apple TV plus show dark matter. We're going to follow up with that and go into probably the boys, the new season when it comes out in July. So uh, before that, we'll be doing Deadpool and Wolverine. You could hear on podcastica.com you could actually what else is out there uh the last uh the cast of us i keep saying the cast of us uh the last of us <laughs> it's the cast of us and you got jason and lucy continuing with their coverage of season two of their rewatch of the walking dead so uh they're coming towards the end at this point of season two and it was a pivotal season two for the walking dead so check that out do so with uh, fresh ears and go back to the original recordings. This is uh, this revisited version would be more or less if uh, you've already seen the whole series and show in that season and their recollection and what their thoughts and theories are of now. But uh, other than that, yeah, you have the revisited podcast, which is also a collaborative podcast with Wilhelm and podcast. Uh, and that's Ben Beck and our friend Kristen. And they're doing and finalizing all of Ted Lasso season three. So check that out. It makes me laugh, and cry, and just love what they're talking about when it comes to Ted Lasso in that final season. Danny, do you have any picks for Podcastica or anything that's going on in the Podcastica universe? So I am going to do a rewatch of the second season of Yellow Jacket. Oh. And I'm still confused of what that show is about. So I'm going to hope that the Yellow Jacket WTF helps me <laughs> better understand that second season. Yeah, definitely check out uh, Yellow Jacket's WTF on podcastica.com. Awesome. Uh, we're, uh, they already are working on the new season, season three. So, uh, uh, it, it, they're all those are available on iTunes, by the way. So if you need to go buy them, I just recently purchased season two. It's like 25 bucks. Go get it. <laughs> so, uh, and then go watch it. If not, if you have showtime, go watch it there or Paramount. Yeah. I think Paramount's subsidiary of, of showtime or they're collaborative at yeah. that point. So, uh, you could check those episodes out and you could check out the, uh, uh, Yellow Jackets WTF, which actually follows through those particular seasons. I think they did season one. They did a again rewatch of season one again, and then they did season two, and then they have their fan theories and thoughts. Check them out episodically. My advice to Danny: go episode by episode and listen to the original podcasts of each episode yeah. of Yellow Jackets uh, WTF. After or after you've watched those particular episodes, it's pretty great. It was fun. It was during the pandemic, everybody, and we had fun doing live watches and us chatting afterwards, and then them eventually doing the podcast. But yeah. uh, it, it's a great show. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, if you're not into that kind of thing, there are other things out there, like Welcome to the Apocalypse with uh, Randy and everybody else. So it's uh. Eh, it's an improvisational uh, kind of podcast uh, about storytelling 
of uh, people in the apocalypse itself. Uh, zombie apocalypse, to be specific. So keep up with that and check that out on podcastica.com. Laura, do you have anything? Well, up next in my podcast queue is Run for Your Lives with Pake and Daphne. They've got their Run for Your Lives Season 7 awards coming up. So I'm interested to see who their picks are for this season. Take hmm. a listen to that. Otherwise, I think Podcastica, who you know will occasionally do shows not episode by episode, but cover an entire season, just covered Fallout, which I'm going to listen to because we finished Fallout last week. So <laughs> I'm interested to hear what Jason and his co-hosts um, thoughts are on that show. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really loved Fallout watching it. I kind of binged watched it because I had to because I wasn't podcasting on it, everybody. <laughs> but I got to listen to Jason, Ben and uh, Jason's friend just jump on and have a good time talking about fallout the whole season honestly it's one whole podcast everybody so uh, i highly recommend that check that out the podcast as well as the show if you have not watched it it's a video game based show probably one of the better ones out there along with the last of us i would say third after that would be twisted metal so that's just my thoughts <laughs> And there. Podcastica and The Cast of Us also covered The Last of Us, if you want to go back and watch that. Yes, that as well, too. That was a great and series. And they cover yeah. House of the Dragon, which is coming up soon, which I am super excited for. I got my husband to start watching last season of um, House of the Dragon, so we're halfway through that so that he'll be caught up by season two. Awesome. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that as well. Right. I, I think that about covers the episode. I think we... Uh, Gabbed yeah. and gabbed and gabbed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next week, we are covering season two, episode four. I want you more than anything in the world. And that is our coverage for this episode. And I just want to thank everyone for listening. I'm Mark. I'm Danny. And I'm Lara. And this was the Vampcast. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.